This is a day of affirmation, a celebration of liberty. We stand here in the name of freedom, at the heart of that Western freedom and democracy is the belief that the individual man, the child of God, is the touchstone of value, and all society, all groups and states exist for that person's benefit. Therefore, the enlargement of liberty for individual human beings must be the supreme goal and the abiding practice of any Western society. The first element of this individual liberty is the freedom of speech, the right to express and communicate ideas, to set oneself apart from the dumb beasts of field and forest, the right to recall governments to their duties and to their obligations. Above all, the right to affirm one's membership and allegiance to the body politic, to society, to the men with whom we share our land, our heritage, and our children's future. Hand in hand with freedom of speech goes the power to be heard, to share in the decisions of government which shape men's lives. Everything that makes man, man's life worthwhile, family, work, education, a place to rear one's children and a place to rest one's head, all this depends on the decisions of government. All can be swept away by a government which does not heed the demands of its people, and I mean all of its people. Therefore, the essential humanity of man can be protected and preserved only where government must answer, not just to the wealthy, not just to those of a particular religion, not just to those of a particular race, but to all of the people. And even government, by the consent of the governed, as in our own constitution, must be limited in its power to act against its people, so that there may be no interference with the right to worship, but also no interference with the security of the home. No arbitrary imposition of pains or penalties on an ordinary citizen by officials high or low. No restriction on the freedom of men to seek education or to seek work or opportunity of any kind so that each man may become all that he is capable of becoming. Many nations have set forth their own definitions and declarations of these principles. And there have often been wide and tragic gaps between promise and performance, ideal and reality. Yet the great ideals have constantly recalled us to our own duties. And with painful slowness, we in the United States have extended and enlarged the meaning and the practice of freedom to all of our people. So the road toward equality of freedom is not easy and great cost and danger march alongside all of us. We are committed to peaceful and nonviolent change, and that is important to all to understand, though change is unsettling. Still, even in the turbulence of protest and struggle, is greater hope for the future, as men learn to claim and achieve for themselves the rights formally petitioned from others. And most important of all, all of the panoply of government power has been committed to the goal of equality before the law as we are now committing ourselves to the achievement of equal opportunity. In fact, we must recognize the full human equality of all of our people before God, before the law, and in the councils of government. We must do this not because it is economically advantageous, although it is, not because the laws of God command it, although they do, not because people in other lands wish it so. We must do it for the single and fundamental reason that it is the right thing to do. In a few hours, the plane that brought me to this country crossed over oceans and countries which have been a crucible of human history. In minutes, we trace migrations of men over thousands of years. Seconds, the briefest glimpse, and we pass battlefields on which millions of men 
once struggled and died. We could see no national boundaries, no vast gulfs or high walls dividing people from people, only nature and the works of man, homes and factories and farms, everywhere reflecting man's common effort to enrich his life. Everywhere new technology and communication brings men and nations closer together. The concerns of one inevitably become the concerns of all. And our new closeness is stripping away the false masks, the illusion of differences, which is the root of injustice and of hate and of war. Only earthbound man still clings to the dark and poisoning superstition that his world is bounded by the nearest hill. His universe ends at river shore. His common humanity is enclosed in the tight circle of those who share his town or his views and the color of his skin. There is discrimination in this world and slavery and slaughter and starvation. Governments repress their people. Millions are trapped in poverty while the nation grows rich and wealth is lavished on armaments everywhere. These are differing evils, but they are the common works of man. They reflect the imperfection of human justice, the inadequacy of human compassion, our lack of sensibility towards the suffering of our fellows. But we can perhaps remember, even if only for a time, those who live with us are our brothers, that they share with us the same short moment of life, that they seek as we do, nothing but the chance to live out their lives in purpose and happiness, winning what satisfaction and fulfillment they can. Surely this bond of common faith, this bond of common goal, can begin to teach us something. Surely we can learn least to look at those around us as fellow men. And surely we can begin to work a little harder to bind up the wounds among us and to become in our own hearts brothers and countrymen once again. The answer is to rely on you, not a time of life but a state of mind, a temper of the will, a quality of imagination, a predominance of courage over timidity, of the appetite for adventure over the love of ease, the cruelties and obstacles of this swiftly changing planet will not yield to the obsolete dogmas and outworn slogans. They cannot be moved by those who cling to a present that is already dying, who prefer the illusion of security to the excitement and danger that come with even the most peaceful progress. It is a revolutionary world we live in, and this generation at home and around the world has had thrust upon it a greater burden of responsibility than any generation that has ever lived. Some believe there is nothing one man or one woman can do against the enormous array of the world's ills. Yet many of the world's great movements of thought and action have flowed from the work of a single man. A young monk began the Protestant Reformation. A young general extended an empire from Macedonia to the borders of the earth. A young woman reclaimed the territory of France. And it was a young Italian explorer who discovered the new world. And the 32-year-old Thomas Jefferson who reclaimed that all men are created equal. These men move the world, and so can we all. Few will have the greatness to bend history itself, but each of us can work to change a small portion of events. And in the total of all those acts will be written the history of this generation. Each time a man stands up for an ideal, or acts to improve the lot of others, or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope. And crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring, those ripples build a current that can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression 